Good afternoon, everybody. So for those of you who might not know me, I'm uh, Anjali Nagale. I'm one of the hospitalists here at BI and also associate chair for the Department of Medicine. I'm subbing in for our chair, Dr. Weissman. Um, so it's with great pleasure I introduce Dr. Samir Parekh. Um, a short introduction for him. Dr. Parekh is professor of hematology and oncology at the Icon School of Medicine and director of myeloma translational research. His research focuses on the immunogenomics of myeloma and B-cell malignancies. He has won several grants and awards for his work, most recently the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation Innovator Award in 2021. Dr. Perry completed his training in internal medicine at Cook County Hospital, where he uh, and then he did his fellowship in hematology and oncology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where he was also a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Ari Melnick. So thank you so much, Dr. Parekh, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Anjali and Hayato for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, as I was mentioning to uh, you, uh, I'm excited as well to talk to the MSBI team as one of my PhD students is going to join you very soon. And uh, I'm hoping in the course of the talk to highlight some of his projects as examples of what uh, uh, you know e clinical scientists can then come and do in my lab. And, and hopefully we'll have more interest from other residents in your program to uh, join and do more of the same. But um, uh, like most of you, I, I started uh, in clinical medicine and finished my hemong training at, at Einstein and uh, I was lucky to have a, a very good uh, lab mentor, Ari Melnick, who was uh, just starting his lab at, at uh, Einstein at that time and he now has moved to Cornell and he has an empire at Cornell. So it, it gave me great training to study uh, transcriptional factors, which are sort of the genetic switches of cancer. And um, around my early faculty years, I had a colleague who actually uh, developed a, a rare form of lymphoma called mantle cell lymphoma. This is a, a subtype of B cell lymphomas uh, that is actually incre increasing in, in predominance. But uh, uh, this particular uh, colleague, unfortunately, uh, had several relapses and, and ultimately passed away. So this spurred me to kind of study this lymphoma as, as a prototype for how we could tackle um, the disease uh, in uh, application of our immunogenomic pipelines that we were putting together at that time. And I hope it will convey some sense of our approach. So uh, in terms of mantle cell lymphoma, this is an unusual entity uh, because it's a B cell lymphoma which also expresses T cell antigens. And the only other disease that does that is CLL, which is one of the most common uh, chronic leukemias as you know of. Moreover, um, this disease is thought to be driven by a gene called cyclin D1 uh, and many years ago, people had uh, identified a recurrent translocation 1114 that was seen in every patient with this disease. Um, so everybody thought that cyclin D1 was the cause of the disease. And uh, when people actually modeled it in the mouse, it turned out not to be true because the mice did not develop any signs of lymphoma. So the cause was still not known, but over the last uh, decade, uh, there has been an oral BTK inhibitor, uh, actually several generations now of BTK inhibitors that uh, are approved for this disease. So we know that B cell receptor signaling is turned on. We don't know why, and I'll give you some uh, insights into how we figured out why. And this drug, Ibrutinib, was actually a um, uh, $15 billion uh, entity when it was uh, created and then brought out uh, by uh, pharmacyclic. So um, what we uh, started uh, doing is, is first asking very simple questions. Um, how often was SOX11 expressed in mantle cell? And we found that actually it was expressed in about 90% of the patients. And uh, in fact, uh, even patients that did not have cyclin D1 overexpression had it. So it was a very good marker for the pathologist 
but was it doing something functional in this? And that's what we tackled next. And, and we had actually a paper uh, several years ago which described that it actually bound to several pieces of uh, DNA which regulated genes that were very important in B-cell proliferation. So it seemed to have an oncogenic role in the assays that we developed, but really the breakthrough came up when we started modeling this in mice. So there was a report from Spain where uh, they, they took human cell lines that overexpress SOX11 and put them in mice and when these uh, cell lines were then genetically engineered to uh, knock out the SOX11, the size of the tumors uh, became smaller. So this suggested this was having some regulation of cell growth. And uh, to do the experiment uh, of, of what it did in vivo, we actually developed the first transgenic mouse that overexpressed SOX11 in B cells. And um, this mouse was developed um, around the time when uh, I was at leaving Einstein and moving to Sinai as a, a translational scientist. So we actually thought that we would kind of shut down this project and uh, you know wouldn't do much further with it. It turned out that they, they, there was a new technology at Sinai which was called mass cytometry, just kind of like flow cytometry but on steroids. So we decided to apply these uh, new techniques to study the mice and lo and behold, we actually found that the mites were developing a disease very much like the human lymphoma. They had an increase in lymphocytes that were clonal in the blood, spleen, lymph node, and bone marrow. Um, and they had an overexpression of CD19. You can see this orange population is the aberrant lymphocytes that CD19 positivity you can see in red over here, and also CD5 positivity, which is a T cell marker, as I mentioned before. Uh, the only other disease is CLL. The distinction from CLL is that CLL has CD23 positivity. Here you can see the cells are CD23 negative, shown in blue over here. So we published this in blood, and uh, we actually uh, can see here the spleens of these mice are completely replaced by, uh, uh, in normal conditions, they have this uh, follicular structure. This is completely replaced by B lymphocytes. And uh, we know that these are B lymphocytes because they stain for B cell markers like B220, and they are highly proliferative as shown by this KI67 stain. And we did some B cell sequencing to actually show that these were indeed clonal cells and that these were overexpressing the B cell receptor and, and the signaling pathway was aberrantly activated. We actually found that the breaks for the signaling pathway were decreased in these mice, and that led to this aberrant activation. So this was the first transgenic model of mantle cell lymphoma that recapitulated the disease. And I'm happy to say now this model is actually being used widely by multiple labs all over studying mantle cell lymphoma as a platform for drug development. And in fact, we can do bone marrow transplant experiments where we take the mouse bone marrow and give it to other lethally radiated hosts and this causes a rapid expansion phenotype which can then be used to study new drugs or, or therapies. We have also developed a, a double cross so the mice are then uh, crossed with cyclin D1 mice which was the other oncogene I mentioned earlier and these mice develop an even more fulminant phenotype which uh, we are studying now in terms of new treatments and things like that. So in terms of, of making a, a, a drug for this, this is a very uh, interesting and challenging problem because a lot of the oncology uh, drugs currently available now are kinase inhibitors. These are small molecules that can bind to a pocket, uh, an ATP binding pocket that's there on a kinase, but we don't have the same pockets on transcription factors. So there is no standard way of approaching this. I was incredibly lucky to meet a scientist who was modeling transcription factors, um, who was initially at Oxford and is now at Sinai. He's a senior scientist who has actually built out a, a lab to study this. And he suggested that we actually model this uh, using crystal structures. And we found a very interesting thing. So SOX11, which is shown here in blue, bind it to the minor groove of DNA as compared to most other transcription factors that bind to the major groove. And this created a pocket like a bangle around a wrist. 
So there was a little space for small molecules to actually come in and inhibit the binding of this transcription factor to the DNA and thereby inhibit its function. So we used this hypothesis to actually screen almost 13 million compounds computationally and then we actually found a family of compounds that were able to uh, bind to this particular groove and inhibit SOX11 binding to DNA. Using this, we actually uh, applied to a competition between four institutions, uh, including Columbia, Hopkins, and, and UPenn. And amongst 400 labs, this project was chosen as the project to get funded and develop a drug. So we had four labs actually working in sync to develop a, a drug for this transcription factor. And indeed, we were able to find a, a compound uh, which we call compound R, it doesn't have a name yet, which uh, worked actually better than ibrutinib, which was the approved BTK inhibitor that I mentioned before. And uh, this shows that it kills more cells than ibrutinib can in vitro. And uh, in, indeed, it even switches off the B-cell receptor signaling, uh, which we published last year. Uh, we've now gone on to test this compound in models of uh, patient cells that are resistant to ibrutinib and indeed even resistant to the, the next drug after ibrutinib called venetoclax. And this drug seems to work even in those patients. So it's really exciting. We are actually uh, 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 screening a whole library of, of compounds to build better and better molecules uh, that can ultimately be taken to the clinic. So right now we're in the phase one uh, of, of the target optimization phase. And ultimately, we are hoping to go to IND filing in, in a couple of years. Um, I'm now going to switch to the, the mandate which I, I came to Sinai with, which was to develop translational research in, in myeloma. And uh, coming from lymphoma background, you know, I, I basically took this as, as a new challenge and uh, started from scratch. So, so the first thing I realized is that uh, the uh, genetic heterogeneity in myeloma patients is tremendous. So we have very crude clinical classifications for this, but they don't really match up to the wide variety of patient presentations that we see in clinic. And uh, typically the clinical classification just uses two chemistry values, albumin and beta-2 microglobulin, to divide the patients into stage one, two, and three, but it doesn't take into account uh, all the different genetic lesions as shown in this circus plot on, on the right. So uh, the first thing we did was uh, we actually reclassified the disease using a very large data set that Sinai had participated in. Um, this is called the COMPASS data set and over here about 1100 patients uh, tumors were analyzed uh, by different next-gen sequencing techniques and, and this big data set is now available completely free. The reason actually the data set came into being was uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, breast cancer and lung cancer and certain other cancers were actually analyzed by the NCI as part of this big uh, data set called uh, TCGA Atlas. And myeloma was excluded from that. So the myeloma patients got furious and they actually banded together and said, we'll contribute our money. The pharmaceuticals said, we will contribute money. And they all got together and made this huge data set. And then the challenge became for investigators like me was how to analyze the data. And we took this um, actually parallel between social networks and gene networks where, you know, in a, in a network like Facebook, you might have one prominent influencer then influences a number of other uh, people. It works similarly in gene networks where you have a hub gene that can then uh, express and influence a number of downstream genes. So we created, similar to a social network, a gene co-expression network. And in fact, we've now built several versions of this and our last iteration was published uh, in Science Advances last year where we took six different platforms and compiled them all to make a network and this network had three big uh, features that were clustering together that uh, actually mimicked some of the known genetic problems we know in myeloma. But we were actually build out a 12 class system where co-occurring genetic lesions could now be understood and put together. And we showed in this paper that we could actually prognosticate better than the clinical staging system. So 
The clinical staging system has, has essentially three groups, but we could actually develop into 12 groups, all with different prognostic implications. In fact, we found that some of the good patients, according to the clinical system, did not all, always have a good prognosis. If they had co-occurring genetic lesions, such as 1Q, these good patients actually had a worse prognosis. Conversely, some patients that were considered bad by fish cytogenetics by our current clinical staging actually have a better prognosis and we could discriminate these by actually staging this using our network classification, which we call PSN. Um, one thing that came out was that uh, the gain of uh, 1Q, the long arm of chromosome Q, was a major determinant of poor outcomes. And our current research, actually, uh, I have a postdoc and, and uh, very nice collaboration with uh, uh, Heidelberg, where we are trying to dissect why this particular uh, chromosomal abnormality confers uh, adverse prognostic impact in myeloma. Uh, we have actually identified a, an RNA editing enzyme called ADAR1 as a candidate on 1Q. So as 1Q is amplified in myeloma, ADAR1 expression goes up. And this enzyme typically works to edit uh, RNA. The reason we need to edit RNA is we have evolutionary uh, conservation and, and we've evolved to actually cut out exogenous viral RNAs that have infected the human organism over the past few million years. And like COVID-19 or HIV, we have inborn systems for protecting us from these viruses by edit editing the uh, viral sequences out. So ADAR is a conserved RNA editing enzyme, but what we learned through our uh, genomic analysis was that while ADAR was doing its job of RNA editing, it formed these R loops in the DNA-RNA hybrids where the DNA was nicked while ADAR was editing RNA and it created a mutation. So this is actually a completely new way of making mutations. You all know about ultraviolet uh, radiation and uh, chemotherapy and other ways by mutation, which cause mutations. Now we have a new, uh, identified a new causative factor for mutations, which is aberrant RNA editing. Uh, indeed, we've now taken uh, not just the prognostic uh, significance, but using large CRISPR screens and databases like DepMap, we've identified vulnerabilities for each of the 12 classes of myeloma patients that are identified using the PSN. And uh, this is one such representation of these 12 classes. Uh, we have, uh, for example, shown that uh, BCL2 inhibitor that is showing a lot of promise in myeloma patients and usually given to patients that have this translocation 1114 doesn't always work in, in these patients. And we've figured out the reason for this is because there are uh, a number of factors that balance cell death and uh, prevent cell death. And uh, this is actually one of the things to come out of, of uh, the PSN that the expression of MCL1 counters BCL2 and we can select out patients more precisely to get BCL2 inhibitors by looking at their our classification in the PSN system. So most of the work so far that I mentioned was important for newly diagnosed patients. But at Sinai, we are a quaternary referral center. So we get patients from other oncologists that have usually gone through lots and lots of treatment and they generally failed treatment options uh, that are FDA approved. So they're coming to us for clinical trials or for new approaches that really aren't available in the clinic. And we were inspired by this lady, Kathy Giusti, to actually develop a new computational pipeline to identify and help these patients. So Kathy herself is, is the founder of the Myeloma Research Foundation, and she's a myeloma survivor herself who uh, amazingly had a uh, matched twin who gave her an allo transplant um, more than 15 years ago. And Kathy has been alive and, and well, uh, thanks to that, and has made it her life's mission to actually get next generation treatments to myeloma patients. And she runs over uh, you know, a $100 million fund and teaches at Harvard Medical School and, and is, is really inspirational. 
So uh, based on her uh, push to get these treatments to relapse patients, we actually developed a sequencing pipeline with the help of computational biologists at Sinai, which linked both druggable mutations and drug repurposing opportunities seen in the RNA with large databases that are available for drug repurposing, uh, essentially finding drugs that may be outside of the myeloma toolbox in other solid tumors like breast cancer or renal cancer or even melanoma and bringing them to myeloma patients based on common genetic lesions. And we were actually able to analyze this and published a pilot study of over 68 patients where we were able to find treatments for more than 90% of them uh, using this pipeline. And we actually have a whole system in the clinic where we're able to take the patient's bone marrow and sequence it. And within two weeks, we come up with a ranked uh, drug list that uh, we can query using this database and portal that we've set up. It looks uh, something like this when we give out the report where we have different mutations or genetic lesions linked to certain drugs and we can actually give it uh, give a drug recommendation, not just for single drugs, but even drug combinations. Uh, so uh, I'll give you an example uh, of, of uh, a patient who uh, was supposed to go to hospice. He was a 70 year old who was referred uh, from Dr. Uh, Sundar Jagannath, who is the chair of the, the myeloma program at, at Sinai, to me because he was essentially failing uh, all FDA approved drugs. And uh, we sequenced this tumor and instead of going to hospice, we actually recommended a, a combination of drugs based on his genetic lesions and this was his report. So he got a combination of Mechanist and Ibrance. Mechanist is a drug that's uh, actually developed for skin cancer and Ibrance is used in uh, breast cancer and, and we actually combined these two in his case because of his genetic makeup and this was his tumor uh, graph uh, as he started it and he lived actually for um, more than six months after he started this in remission he was a painter and actually finished a very nice uh, painting uh, which they've actually made a video you can see it on the Sinai website uh, about his journey and we have continued to do this work and publish on it. You can see here, this is a initial report uh, that we had done on, on the first uh, uh, 25 patients or so. We have actually now been funded by the NCI through the RO1 mechanism to do a version two of this trial with more sophisticated clonal based uh, drug repurposing and also building immune uh, therapeutics into this uh, prediction pipeline. So. Uh, coming to immune therapies, the two most exciting immune therapies for myeloma are genetically engineered T cells called CAR T cells and bispecific antibodies, uh, which work a little bit differently. They're kind of the poor man's T cell where they actually take uh, one target, which is the myeloma cell and draw our own endogenous T cells to the myeloma cell without any genetic engineering. So it basically works like a CAR-T without going through the whole manufacturing process of a CAR-T. And both of these approaches are showing really promising response rate. There are two CAR-Ts already approved for myeloma with 90 to 95% response rate. Uh, the uh, half a dozen companies have trials open in bispecific antibodies, uh, all showing an excess of 70 to 80% response rate. And at Sinai itself, we've treated more than 120 patients in the last couple of years. But what happens after these patients relapse? And actually, um, one of the, the students, uh, Oliver, who I mentioned to you, is working on this problem. And he showed that despite uh, the problem of relapse and despite patients having unexpected severe toxicities like hemophagocytic syndrome, this is a, a patient at Sinai who died of HPS, you can see macrophages involving his lung and liver. Uh, we, were, we are able to analyze these patients longitudinally to actually come up with ways to understand why each patient relapses and what to do after they relapse. So um, Oliver uh, also described actually a very interesting patient um, in, in an article in Nature Medicine, which was published uh, last year. Uh, this patient had an unusual toxicity where uh, he was actually a guitarist for a rock band and, and after his CAR-T he was completely in remission, doing great, 
practicing several hours a day, even giving concerts. And he came to us one day saying he couldn't hold his guitar. And then I was like, this is strange. You're someone who's so active. What's going on? And, and we examined him and he had uh, tremors and, and features of Parkinson's. So we sent him to two different neurologists who confirmed that he indeed was developing a very rapidly progressing uh, Parkinson's like neurotoxicity. And this was concerning to us. We actually um, analyzed him with uh, lumbar puncture, uh, MRIs, and other workup. And uh, what was uh, very sad was that he kept getting worse week by week. And we even tried to kill off the CAR T cells with chemotherapy, didn't work. Ultimately, the patient passed away. Uh, what we found in this workup, though, was very informative. And in fact, because of this, the, the, there's a black box warning in this CAR T product now based on his case. Uh, what we found was uh, a particular part of his um, brain over here circled in red uh, called the caudate nucleus uh, was uh, getting uh, destroyed. So you can see the uptake in the caudate nucleus going down in his uh, longitudinal scans. And in fact, the reason it was getting destroyed was that it was totally fibrotic. When he died, we were able to do an autopsy and look at his brain and had a, had a T cell infiltrate in, in this part of the brain. And the pathologist was shocked. He said, I've never seen so many T cells in the brain. This is totally unusual. Uh, the reason he was getting this, which was completely unknown, uh, was that the target of the CAR T, which is supposed to be only on plasma cells, was actually being expressed at low levels in the brain, in the caudate. And we've actually confirmed this even in normal caudate. So this is something that can happen to other patients. And indeed, after we described this case, there was actually a smattering of cases across clinical trials that was reported with similar findings. And, and as I mentioned, it is now a black box warning and part of the uh, routine monitoring that uh, has been requested by, by the company. So this uh, was an interesting case. The, the immunologic side of it was interesting as well because in his particular case, the, the patient actually had a type of CAR T that was more stem-like and this led to a higher persistence that may have contributed to this uh, phenomenon. Usually the CAR T's are supposed to um, grow in the body for a few months and then go away. For, um, for an unknown reason, he had developed a very strange type of CAR T which was driven by IL-7 receptor to have a stem-like phenotype which stayed on much longer, actually penetrated the CNS and caused this fatal neurotoxicity. We've had other patients with unusual toxicities and I can uh, highlight one of them which, which uh, I kind of brought us uh, into COVID research in, in a very unexpected way. So this patient was another uh, person coming to my clinic who had received CAR T, was completely in remission and based on international recommendations, we had vaccinated him for COVID-19 uh, three months after the CAR T. And despite vaccination, he had actually had negative serology. So we were a little worried, but the patient was feeling like he was protected. So he went out, he had a girlfriend, so he wanted to impress her, went to the gym, worked out, all that. And a few days later, he comes to clinic, short of breath, febrile, COVID positive, lands up in the ICU and dies. And we were all completely shocked by this. We actually then developed a whole pipeline to study the immune system in these myeloma patients uh, and found that a lot of them were not developing antibodies. They were not developing even the B cells that recognized COVID-19 despite being vaccinated, nor did they have T cell responses. And this actually led to another paper by Oliver, which was published in Cancer Cell. This was the largest study of myeloma patients uh, showing that in general, myeloma patients don't mount the same antibody responses that healthy volunteers do. And in fact, about 15% of them have zero antibodies despite full vaccination. Even the kinetics of vaccine response are very different. And uh, particularly patients that are getting BCMA targeted or anti-CD38, this is another new target in myeloma uh, for antibodies, were uh, prone for getting no vaccine responses. So this was a vulnerable population identified by these studies. And in fact, we built on this by looking at T cell responses, showing a stark difference in these BCMA and CAR T treated patients, particularly 
having lower T cell responses um, based on uh, an, a, a T cell assay that was developed at Sinai. And uh, this has led to a, a series of changes. In fact, we have NCI funding through CRNet to continue to look at these patients, uh, give them additional doses of uh, vaccination, both um, heterologous vaccination as well as passive immunity using antibodies like Evusheld to protect them. And uh, this has become a whole effort now in the clinic. Um, another unexpected sort of uh, spin-off of our CAR-T research was uh, with the cytokine profiling. So we were using cytokines to measure when CAR-Ts are given to a patient and they develop cytokine response syndrome, how do we treat them? And the typical treatment is using an IL-6 inhibitor called tocilizumab. We have found in several patients that develop severe CRS, and this is published a couple of years ago, that tocilizumab alone is not enough, and we have to give IL-1 inhibition on top of IL-6 inhibition, and this patient sort of uh, uh, really highlighted that need. And to, to do this in real time, we actually bought a machine uh, that is cartridge-based that has these little cartridges, you just put a little bit of serum, and in two hours, you know the serum cytokines. And uh, the immunology and pathology labs actually took this test and ran it on over 2,000 patients that had COVID. And uh, they actually learned that the same cytokines that cause uh, CRS in CAR-T patients are elevated in COVID patients and in fact are prognostic. So this was another a publication by the immunology group uh, uh, using an offshoot of CAR-T technology to study COVID. Um, my lab is now focusing on improving CAR-T efficacy. As I mentioned, uh, we are having a cohort of patients that have gone through CAR-T and are now relapsing. So we have to urgently figure out what to do for these patients. And uh, Oliver actually presented this work at ASH last year where uh, in the first 70 odd patients that got, got CAR-T, we already have more than 30 that have relapsed. And to salvage them, we've used different therapies. What we learned with his analysis was that actually these patients could go on to other immunotherapies uh, such as monoclonal antibodies or bispecific antibodies. And these seem to actually give the best responses. And uh, to give you a sense, this is uh, what is called a swimmer's plot of these patients. And you can see here that a life after CAR-T doesn't end. So these patients go on to live for one, two, even three years. And in fact, many of them, uh, I'm just gonna highlight one treatment, which is the one in orange, can get other immune therapies like bispecific antibodies. These are all the patients that got bispecifics and go on to benefit for many months or even years. So this breaks up a uh, sort of a uh, preconceived notion that people had in the myeloma community that once you fail CAR-T, you can't get any other therapy. And this actually shows you can sequence one immunotherapy to the other. And we have actually another fellow in the lab who's looked at the other, the sequence the other way around. Patients that are failing bispecifics who get CAR-T. And we now have evidence that both approaches are, are okay and are using uh, high resolution immune technologies to understand why the sequencing matters and how to do it better. Um, so one of the early reports uh, that Oliver put together a few years ago was using a high dimensional flow platform looking at a drug called pomalidomide, which it stimulates the immune system. This is the third generation analog of thalidomide, which many of you may know caused teratogenicity in the 1960s and became the first myeloma drug in the 1990s. Uh, so pomalidomide was the, the third drug, and our lab showed that actually in the bone marrow where the myeloma cells reside, pomalidomide causes T cell activation and NK cell activation, and this causes an, uh, a tumor kill independent of the direct tumor kill caused by these imids. And in fact, based on that work, uh, Oliver and I have been working with uh, CC220, which is the next image that's going to come and, and basically take over all of myeloma uh, from uh, the current generation of images. And uh, we have shown in over 100 patients using sequential bone marrows. In fact, we were the reference lab for North America and collaborated with Oxford uh, to look at marrows from a worldwide study of this new drug. 
to show that the drug activates both T cells and NK cells and we were able to define actually the precise dose that led to this immunological activation to define what should be used ultimately in patients as the recommended uh, phase two and phase three dose. So this is now being written up and uh, we are actually working with um, the BMS, who is the, the company that makes this drug, to combine it with CAR-T and, and this is a study called Karma 7 that's actually designed to combine these two drugs that's opening soon at Sinai and we will be doing the immune correlatives uh, with the company in real time on our patients. So this is a, an example of a project which you know a resident or somebody from your group could actually come in and uh, see in real time and participate in. Um, in the last um, five, 10 minutes, I'm going to uh, focus on an exciting new project that has come out of the classification work that I showed earlier in the talk. So um, just to remind you, uh, when we did this social network based classification called PSN, the PSN divided patients into three broad groups and 12 subgroups. And the second big group was uh, consisting of patients that overexpressed uh, MMZ and MAF due to translocations. These are two oncogenes that uh, confer particularly bad prognosis. Uh, looking at a, a number of uh, genetic lesions altogether in, in this kind of a plot, we were able to find that almost all the patients in this group overexpressed a particular gene called NUAK1 or ARC5. ARC5 is, is another name for NUAK1. And ARC5 stands for AMPK related kinase. Uh, so this is an integrator of uh, cellular met metabolism and actually regulates gl glutamine uptake and MYC expression in myeloma cells. You can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve that the patients in group two that overexpress um, or tra translocate uh, MAF and MM site do much worse than other myeloma patients. So we wanted to make something that could particularly help these patients. And indeed, uh, we worked with a chemist at uh, Sinai who had developed a drug for breast cancer actually that had, interestingly, uh, a very strong inhibition of ARC5 as an off-target effect. Um, and uh, the drug was developed against CDK4-6, which is very important in breast cancer. But because of its inhibition of ARC5, we actually tested it in myeloma cell lines and in myeloma models in, in mice and found that it was extremely potent, was able to kill myeloma cells without killing normal cells, and was able to kill even resistant cells. Uh, as you can see here, if we tested it on healthy PBMCs, the drug had, uh, had no toxicity, and in fact, looked very promising in mouse models. Uh, what was particularly relevant to our catchment area was that, um, as I'll show you in a minute, um, the, the drug inhibits glutamine uptake, and uh, this is important in patients that have diabetes. Uh, glutamine is another source for, for uh, glucose uh, metabolism, and, and um, patients that have diabetes uh, may be actually treated by this drug to both uh, improve their sugar control as well as treat their myeloma. This is particularly important as a large meta-analysis published last year showed that if you had myeloma and diabetes, the patients had a 30% higher chance of mortality. So uh, frequently, even if the patients are pre-diabetic, a cornerstone of myeloma therapy is steroids, and we give them a lot of steroids through the course of their therapy, so they actually develop over diabetes. And in fact, we've done some analysis on our own patient populations and uh, shown that the patients that develop uh, therapy-induced uh, uh, diabetes uh, do worse than patients that don't have diabetes. So uh, in order to uh, test this, we've actually now collaborated with uh, endocrinologists. So Emily Gallagher is an endocrinologist at, at Sinai um, who has um, developed these uh, great mouse models of pre-diabetes. And um, the way she does it is that she has a mutated IGF receptor and the mice develop very high IGF levels, very similar to uh, diabetic patients. And then based on the uh, uh, feeding, we can actually make these mice overt diabetic and obese or not. 
what we found what was uh, eye popping and really surprising to us was that if we injected myeloma cells into these pre-diabetic mice they grew at three to five times the rate of growing in the wild type mice so this uh, high insulin environment actually created a direct drive for uh, tumor growth through the IGF signaling pathway and uh, we, we are now um, uh, working with the NCI to actually develop a clinical trial and uh, we've gotten some funding to actually take it to the clinic so we are uh, uh, working on a trial this is very important in Sinai because in this graph I'm showing you the percentage of our population that is either obese and diabetic and, and there's actually a, a disparity here where African American patients with myeloma have higher rates of both obesity and diabetes and, and this may be particularly important in our catchment area uh, where we have a high African American population. Um, so with that I'm, I'm going to uh, stop and give a few minutes for um, uh, questions. Uh, this is uh, Oliver who I will uh, credit a lot of the work to. You're going to see him soon as an intern in, in your institution. Uh, I also want to thank other people in the lab. Uh, we have about 15 people, uh, both dry lab and, and wet lab uh, folks. So uh, David and Adolfo are PhD students. We have postdocs and senior scientists and even um, assistant professors like Alessandro. Uh, we have a strong uh, collaboration with the immunology labs at Sinai as well as uh, sequencing cores. And uh, I'm, I'm one of nine physicians um, in a growing myeloma program um, and, and uh, last but not least I'd like to thank the patients that give to these studies because without their samples we would not be able to do them and of course the funding agencies uh, uh, such as NCI and MMRF and others that have uh, supported the research over the years. So with that I'll, I'll stop and uh, take questions. Uh, Anjali or Hayat, or do you all want to moderate? I don't know if you'll have a chat as well. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Parikh, um, for the amazing talk. Uh, and then thank you so much for like involving um, Oliver, um, Oliver's and Victor um, in your presentation. It's great. Um, uh, and then to the audience, like, do you guys have any um, questions, comments? Dr. Pri. Um, from team one, well, thank you. Uh, it's a case of refractory MM who responded pretty well to combination therapy based on molecular profiling was very interesting. I guess standard doses of the medications are not established for this molecular based combination. How do you um, usually decide the dosage of each medication in this approach? Also, have you ever encountered unexpected adverse events by giving molecular based combination therapy great question. that's a great question so I, i'll refer you to our um, publication uh, in jco precision medicine from a few few years ago but um, the the way we uh, actually uh, start most um, patients is based on their hematological toxicity so uh, there are standard recommended doses for most of these agents in the tumor type that they may be applied in, but that's assuming that patients have a normal uh, hemogram. And in most myeloma patients with advanced refractory myeloma, they have cytopenia, so we need to dose reduce. And we generally uh, work with specialty pharmacists who sit in our clinic to actually come up with a recommended dose to give, particularly when we are giving combinations. Um, indeed, we have learned the hard way uh, some, with some drugs that when we've given them to the patients, they do become very cytopenic. They even have other um, therapy-related uh, adverse effects. For example, uh, trametinib or mechanist, which that patient received, he didn't have this, but other patients in my clinic have developed heart failure. So we've learned to do echocardiograms and, and follow them and uh, counsel the patients about watching for cardiac symptoms and things like that. Um, so, so we really have to be careful using these. Even getting the drugs is, is not trivial. Uh, we actually have a whole system in the clinic where the pharmacist is educated about how to present the case to the insurance agencies. These are not automatically uh, approved for myeloma, so we generally go through 
a negotiation with the uh, patient's insurance to make a case that the patient has no other options. I think they may uh, benefit from this treatment and we are usually able to convince them to get these medications. And in fact, we now have post-CAR T relapse patients that are going on to get similar salvage. So this is becoming increasingly important. Thank you for the great answer. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions, comments? I have a question. Um, so thank you so much for this uh, amazing talk. It's really, it's really enlightening to see how um, clinical cases translate into, you know, really interesting translational work. Um, and you gave a whirlwind tour of all the breadth of research you've done. So that was really, really amazing. Um, I had a question about CAR T uh, technology. It seems you know, so promising, so interesting, also terrifying with some of the, the side effects. How often, you know, if you can give me sort of a prevalence, is it being used in my in the myeloma patients? Right. So, so um, the standard treatment pre-CAR T era, uh, if the patient was, uh, you know, under 70, usually, we would try to give them autologous transplants. However, autologous transplants uh, have not proven to be curative in most patients. They extend the um, patient's overall survival by one year, and they have a lot of side effects. Patients are immunocompromised and cytopenic, and, and they stay in the hospital for weeks, uh, have infections, all kinds of things. Interestingly, since the advent of CAR T, our numbers of patients getting autologous transplant have started coming down. We typically did around 150 to 200 auto transplants a year. Now, every year, the number of CAR T is going up and the auto transplants are going down. So uh, last year, for example, we did between 50 and 60 uh, CAR Ts and that number is only going to expand this year because we have two approved products now. So we would need to do them on trials. Um, so my feeling is that uh, the CAR Ts are uh, giving more durable responses than auto transplant, and for that reason, they will slowly potentially um, uh, perhaps make auto transplant extinct. And in fact, there are randomized trials examining this particular question right now. What's uh, on the horizon is that the bispecific antibodies uh, that I mentioned to you, the ones that essentially worked like CAR T, basically taking uh, the endogenous pool of T cells to the tumor, are also showing very good response rates and have much less toxicity. Plus they're available off the shelf. It takes us about two months to make a CAR T product. So some patients can't wait that long and, and actually even progress in between. The biospecifics, uh, if they really uh, show the same um, promise that has been shown in, in lymphoma, for example, may even leapfrog over CAR T and, and replace them as the drug of choice. So I think this is a, a very exciting time in myeloma. It's rapidly evolving with these new treatments coming on board. And, and for translation researchers like me, all these new treatments come up with their own set of research questions and complications and resistance mechanisms. So it's, it's very exciting to study them as they are being developed. Thank you. Um, another question uh, is coming from team 12. Thank you. Uh, interesting to see, to see the higher incidence of myeloma in hyperglycemic status. Uh, do you think that like a better control in glucose level uh, can lead to suppression of uh, like proliferation in myeloma cells in preclinical pre -clinical models. I'm a bit concerned as many myeloma regimens contain glucocorticoids, like which can worsen glycemic control in multiple myeloma patients. Now that's a great point. And I, I think since we've developed this data, uh, I, both the endocrinologists and us are much more careful about uh, fine-tuning the glucose control and, and ensuring that patients uh, who have myeloma and diabetes have very tight glucose control. I think it will definitely help. And uh, I think uh, this is something that's under-recognized. So that's, that's a very good point. Awesome, thank you. And Justin? 
Um, yeah, so I put this in the chat. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Prague, for, for this talk. I was um, wondering, you had mentioned when you were talking about your research on the SOX11, that, that you were able to search for a small molecule inhibitor of that. How does that search process like process work? How did how did we like what did, can you talk to the technology behind that? Because that was just really sounded very bizarre to me. <laughs> sure, sure. So so the way it works is that um, we have uh, crystal structures of uh, different proteins, and uh, we can actually develop our own crystal structures. So once you know the model, once you know the structure of something. Uh, you can then tell a computer, in this case we use a supercomputer because it, it needs a lot of computation power, that this is the model and we want a particular small molecule that will fit this aspect of the model. So you give it a, a predefined uh, space to fit in. Using these constraints, the supercomputer then looks through libraries of known small molecules and these are even public libraries. Um, where you can look through millions and millions of small molecules of, with different uh, availabilities to essentially find molecules that will fit those constraints. Once you have that, the computer will then spit out a list of structures and say, okay, these are the potential fits. But then the wet lab has to then devise assays that take these structures, and we did this. So we had to buy around 150 different structures and actually design assays that would actually test whether putting in a small molecule would disrupt the SOX11 DNA interaction. So we developed a FRET-based assay where, where based on the proximity of the FRET signal would change if the small molecule interfered with it. So we tested each of those 150 compounds and actually found a family that reliably did this at uh, uh, you know high potency. And then that was sort of the starting point of the process. Did that make sense? Uh, yeah, it's 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 useful to know kind of what your lab did to to test the theoretical there. That's so helpful. this was Thank actually you. done in the in the dean of the PhD school's uh, lab, uh, Marta Filizola. So her specialty is computational biophysics, and and this is all they do. They basically model and and run uh, drug libraries against uh, different models. So. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Really impressive. Right, uh, we had a great discussion. And then like, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Breek uh, for that amazing, fascinating talk. And also like, uh, we would greatly appreciate if you uh, like and um, can collaborate with us, our residency program. And also like you can give like guidance to our residents on like uh, how to like get involved in a like, Kimong research in residency. And like, I mean like research in general during residency. Sure. So I'd love to set up a follow up with you, uh, you know, and uh, the chiefs and, and Shrikala, Anjali, uh, who, are the, who are the right people, I think, uh, to discuss this and uh, we should definitely do it. All right. Thank you so much. So I'm going to stop recording and then close the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Preek. Bye bye. Thank you.